Uh, good evening, friends, all of you who are here joining us today, and those of you who are joining us from the comfort of your home. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the IRIS Network and the Center for Intercultural Advancements uh, joint program, um, our LGBTQ plus uh, professional panel. Uh, let's give a round of applause for all of our wonderful panelists who have so generously volunteered their time to be here, and we really appreciate that. Um, some coming from our own backyard here at Wagner, and some coming as far as Jersey, so we always appreciate that. Um, before we hop into anything, I do want to just give um, a couple of big thank yous to some people who were very instrumental um, in making this evening happen. Um, first, I want to thank our friend Sadiq over here uh, for, from the Center for Intercultural Advancement. Um, uh, he was absolutely a driving force behind this evening, and we worked hand in hand in making this happen, so we are very thankful uh, for that. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our administrators, Wagner College senior staff who have supported us and helped us get to this position, um, not only for tonight's program, um, but the Iris Network has definitely benefited um, a lot from support coming from uh, senior staff members and administrators um, here at the college. Um, and finally, a gigantic shout out to Mr. Lee Manchester, who is filming this evening. Um, we always appreciate that. <laughs> and to our friend and vice president of the Iris Network, Lucille Elise Whistler. Um, she has prepared the desserts for tonight, so Ooh, yeah. we'll get to enjoy those after the panel. Um, so before we hop into um, our discussion, I would like to go down the line. Uh, we'll start with our friend Pat here, and if you could all just introduce yourselves, your position, and um, just give us like a one to two minute um, rundown of what you do at your current profession, that would be great. So if you want to take it away, Pat. Cool. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Pat Zapone. Um, I am a new development associate at Paper Mill Playhouse, which is a regional theater in North Jersey. My job is an entry-level position, providing office maintenance and assistance and fundraising operations for the theater, whether that be providing, um, working with corporations, foundations, uh, people who happen to have massive amounts of money, either from their job or they have some sort of trust fund, whatever that may be, or people who donate what they can out of an obsessive, crazy love for theater. So my job also serves as a middleman position between seasoned subscribers and the box office sometimes because we get calls into the office and sometimes people are looking for ticketing and I'm usually the first person that they hear on the phone. So I have some customer service skills that I'm building. Um, and now that we have a membership program, I'm also working directly with donors on that when they call in and ask specific questions about you know, their membership versus their subscription, things like that. Um, I've also been helping my team transition onto new software that I happen to have experience with from my own interning uh, opportunities with TDF and with the State Theater. So I'm also the last resort for the theater if anyone ever needs stamps, which is my most important <laughs> position. So I designate myself the stamp queen or the stamp queer, however you would like to <laughs> place that. Obviously the most important part of my job. But yeah, that's a little bit of what I do. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Dolzer and I'm a media analyst with the Nielsen Company. Pretty much what I do is I take ratings data and I translate it into here's what you actually can learn from this to companies, whether it be broadcast networks, magazines, websites, social media, a whole kind of thing. Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Sloan. I'm the deputy director at the Pride Center of Staten Island. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so, uh, so I'm a nonprofit professional. Um, I've been in the nonprofit sphere for three years. Uh, the Pride Center of Staten Island is a small but mighty organization, which means I do a little bit of everything. Um, but some of my tasks include like uh, development and, and that kind of, you know, like um, uh, getting us more money so we can continue to do the work that we do, um, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, a lot of like writing communications kind of stuff. Uh, before I, I, I sort of like fell into the nonprofit work. Um, I'm a, a, I have my PhD in theater and performance studies and I really thought I was gonna go be a professor um, and that has not um, been my trajectory and I'm happy to talk more about that later if that's interesting. But, um, but uh, here I am. Good evening, my name is Collins. I currently work at the New York Department of Education in Brooklyn. I, um, I'm going to kind of talk on two fronts. I work at the, D at the DOE, and I also am a diversity facilitator focusing specifically on queer issues and at independent schools. So at the DOE, I do admin. Um, I work to support our teacher development, 
program, getting new teachers into the classroom, specifically into the Bronx and Queens. And on the diversity educator, facilitator role, I primarily work with the National Association for Independent Schools doing curriculum building and training for their national conference, um, bringing 1,600 young people who have never seen people like them in a community. Um, and I balance kind of my time between those two places and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is that balance of this is my heart work and this is the work that I do to keep going. Hi, I am uh, Kevin Tressler Gilock. I'm a vice president and account coordinator at MSL Group, which you've probably never heard of, and that's okay. It is a top five PR agency in North America. Um, so I work predominantly on Procter and Gamble's personal healthcare business. So if you've ever seen a celebrity trying to sell you Dayquil or an influencer that wants you to buy Pepto Bismol, I'm sorry, I probably did that. Um, and I take all that great data that Mike's company pumps out and figure out who's buying what and watching when, and I figure out how to work products and services into it. Uh, my name is Tommy Tresser Gilock. I am the Director of Residential Education and Retention Specialist for Campus Life. So I oversee our housing here on campus, Happy Housing Selection. And <laughs> um, I also now serve uh, to help support our college's retention and persistence to help students get to the finish line. Hi, I'm Cyril, and I teach government and uh, in the Government and Politics Department at Wagner. Uh, just briefly, I have three types of research specialization, one of which is uh, sexuality and politics. So um, I'm getting increasingly involved in the national sexuality and politics uh, sort of research circuit. I um, recently became program chair elect for the APSA, which is the American Political Science Association Sexuality and Politics Division. And I'll be chair of that section in three years. It's a rotation, so it's a three year thing. So I'm getting deeply involved in this, like looking at other people's research on this subject and so on. So I'll say a few things about that when my time comes. <laughs> and um, so for now, I'll just stop, but yeah, that's why I'm <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so thank you so much. So I think that the best way to start off um, would be to start at the top of your careers. And why don't we talk a bit about sort of navigating um, the workforce and trying to land a job um, as a queer identifying person. Um, so I want to put this out to the panel. Um, as an LGBTQ identifying person, um, how do you think your experience differed or continues to differ um, from someone who is not part of the community in sort of trying to land a job and trying to um, get work? Anybody want to take that? I'm willing to take that, Great. considering um, I've been searching for a job, or at least I had been searching for a job for several months. Um, because I graduated from Wagner uh, this past May and only recently got this job with Paper Mill Playhouse. Uh, prior to that was mostly volunteer work, um, interning, um, and you know, singing at funerals to try and you know, make a little extra money and get by, because you do what you gotta do. Um, when it's come to that particular search, um, first of all, I will say that I'm probably very lucky to be within the fields and job market that I'm in because I work in the arts, and gay people are everywhere in the arts. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's just always been a continued part of this, and specifically with the theater, like we're everywhere. Like there's no other way about it. So one thing that I will say when it comes to this job search though is, I've helped a few other people when it's come to their job searches in fields that are outside of the arts and it's been a little more difficult so one thing that has happened for me is I have a mentor figure who works in bookkeeping and accounting and she has been working with the same company in New York for about 15 years and the company's going under so she has to find a job and she's looking for work she's not out at her company she's very much in the closet she has been for several years so when it's come to all of her different activities in connection to the community, she has had to create two resumes to send out. One that hides all of that activity, regardless of how wonderful it is and how many skills it showcases when it comes to event planning and research and uh, leadership skills. And having a separate one that maybe doesn't reflect all of those skills that she otherwise has here based on the fear 
that she'll apply to some place and they'll end up seeing her history with the community and thinking that's a bad move. Now, I'm not going to say that a majority of companies are like that. I'm just saying that there is a bias. And for these kinds of situations, there are a lot of queer people who have to be very careful when they prepare these kinds of resumes and send them out. They really have to feel out where they're applying to be sure that if they open up about this sort of stuff, that it'll be a fit. Because at the end of the day, like we all have to eat. We all have to have a salary to work. Excuse me. We all have to eat. Some of us have to support other people. This person in particular has a mother at home who is very elderly and very sick. So she has to support her too. So with this in mind, she's had to walk a tight rope that I'm lucky that I don't have to walk because I don't have dependents at home. I don't have people who are relying on me to make money for them to live as well. So that's one thing I will say that I don't think, I don't think a majority of folks outside of the community really have to think about that. And I mean, my family in particular has found that a little odd that you know we'd have to create two resumes, but I've done it. So I don't know what else to really say beyond the fact that I've done it and I understand I have needed to do that in order to find work for other folks. Anyone else? I mean, I would say when I was first on the job market, like right after I finished college as my, in my undergraduate career, um, that was something I didn't have to negotiate as much just because I'm a feminine presenting person. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have uh, like a wife at home, right? And that's like an easy way to out yourself too. Like, I'm like, like oh, oh, my wife, whatever, like, and that's easy. Um, and it also wasn't like a part of my resume yet. Whereas like if ever I, if, like now, um, given my, like, my education, my experience, et cetera, et cetera, like you read my resume and you're like, oh, she's gay. Right, like it's on. It's I mean, and, and that's a, that's also like a false assumption to make, and we should like for some people that's not necessarily true. For me, it happens to be true, um, but like for me, there would be no escape now. Right, um, I will say too, like uh, like uh, my wife is a masculine and center presenting person. She, I asked her if I could talk about her before I came here, and she said it was okay. Um, but and so uh, like when she goes for interviews and stuff, uh, like she's had to navigate like, well, what do I wear? Right? Do I like tone it down, or do I go in as like my whole self? Um, and so uh, when we, I met when we met, we lived on the West Coast. Now we live here. Um, and when we were on the West Coast, she like kept it like toned down. She was like, "Oh, I can't wear these shoes to work. It's too butch, right?" Um, but like now, when she's interviewing and that kind of stuff, it was like another. It was another time to like negotiate that. Um, and I said to her, "I was like, well, do you want like? We were lucky enough that we were it, we were in a position where we could say like." Like, if this interview doesn't work out, it's going to be okay, right? You can go to like the next interview. We were in a place that we could afford to make that choice, right? Um, but so for the past, for the for her latest career steps, she has gone in sort of like with her little bow tie and her shoe, like and that kind of stuff, right? Um, looking real cute. <laughs> um, uh, and it has not been a barrier for her. She has been accepted. I mean, as long as to me. Or, or I guess the, the choice that we made together was that as long as you look like your most prof as your most professional self, um, you, can, you can't argue with that, right? Um, so that's, I guess, where it has cropped up in my life is through her. Yeah. Talking about that, the word professional. So I, I am a trans man, and my biggest barrier applying for jobs was literally my name. It was the, what do I put on this application? And if they start filling out a W-2 from this, like, it's going to be wrong and having to navigate, I'm gonna have to come out to my employer at some point, when is it? And so seeing that it's a barrier, but it, for me it, it was inevitable. And I kind of relate to that in the fields I'm in, I'm in education and diversity work, for me, often being trans is something I bring, often, I've chosen to bring it to often an interview, but not on a cover letter or resume mm -hmm. as I get in the room and feel, is this something I can talk about here and to what degree? And for me, it's physically being in a space with people and making that decision. Um, but talking about the word professional, like what does dressing professionally mean? For me, it's going to interviews and going, sometimes I'm a fan of wearing nail polish, going, I can't wear nail polish to an interview because I need to present myself as more masculine because that's gonna be read as professional for how I'm gonna show up to work. And finding that line. So for me, it was a, it's a balance of literally, legally, what do I put here? 
Um, and at the time, not having the privilege of legally transitioning my name and paying the money and going through that intensive process and talking about what's going to be not even safe, what's going to get me in the door enough that I can talk about this and finding that balance. Yeah, PR and marketing, I think, is actually kind of a weird space in regards to this topic because I think not unlike the arts, there are gay people literally everywhere. Um, but I think as like a PR person, it's almost the, it's the different end of the spectrum where I I resist like playing the character that I think sometimes people expect because gay men in particular are so prevalent in PR that when you go on an interview, like sometimes people are expecting, you know, like four hundred dollar Louboutin heels and an attitude and big sunglasses and bleach blonde hair. And like if that's you, that's great, but that just doesn't happen to be me. So I don't want to go into an interview like being a character just to like fit, you know, what that agency is that I can please buy maybe. I think Dan, one of the things that I thought about with your question is the navigation as entry level is much different than when I was like mid-level and now as like a senior level officer here at Wagner. And when I was an entry level, it was something that A, I didn't bring up unless I was asked. And that's very awkward, but you know, I had an employer once ask me, you know, if I was dating anyone and trying to get pronouns out of me to help understand that. And I I specifically didn't. I remember getting feedback in an interview I had gone to when I did not get the job, I didn't get every job I ever applied for, spoiler <laughs> alert, but, and the feedback I got was, you didn't seem like you were being yourself. And I thought, similar to what had been said, this may not be the space for me, and I was trying to almost take some of my personality back and maybe over, like, masculate myself, because I can be a little bit more eccentric in some of my, my, my mannerisms, but I think the transition going from an, my entry-level role to my mid-level role and that's where I found more comfort in saying it. We are obviously married, and you know, a big part of my search coming to Wagner was, will Kevin be able to be part of this community with me as we live here and we are expected to be here? And Ruta Shaw Gordon is our vice president, and I had that conversation at some points, and it was very much about making sure he is integrated into our community here because he is very much part of who I am now. And that was important to me in searching that. And that was difficult when we were sitting down talking about do I leave my former job without a position because it was no longer an institutional fit for me, but also making sure that I had to figure out how do I navigate that in an interview? And when I was offered an on-campus interview here, I had to say, time out, I am in a same-sex relationship and is that okay for Wagner as we're gonna be living together? And the response I got was, oh yeah, and Andrew gets upset, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and that, <laughs> but that type of environment was important. It was important for me to gauge on an interview how people reacted when I said, my partner, he works here. And I really took that in. I looked at people to see if they reacted. If I got a a surprise, I knew in the back of my head, catalog that, maybe this isn't a fit for me, but when folks don't react, then I was like, okay, this is an environment. So I think that's important, that entry level shift, and I think Pat, you said it great, sometimes you just need a job. Like college ends and like you need money, it's like the world starts and loans come in, and, <laughs> and for me, I was like, I don't wanna say, right, I don't wanna say I'm gay, but also there's a part of me that was like, maybe I'm gonna round out a team because they're gonna say, oh, he helps bring a diverse perspective to the group. Um, and I had one employer say, oh, we really are trying to make sure we have like check boxes, right, of employers. And you know, sometimes I was like, okay, can I, is that appropriate that I wanna lay into that a little bit, but I don't wanna sell out. Um, so I think that that's my perspective. Uh, I, 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 have, well, I couldn't not declare because my work is such that you know from my resume or CB, we call it. And, but for me, the tricky thing is that, you know, because I fulfill like eight different diversity requirements, I feel like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, which one should I de It's like, I, so I've actually, but I do want to say something serious. Um, there are the same access of, of historically, the, the same access of oppression can also be an access of privilege depending on the context. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I should milk the immigrant bit, I should milk the sort of, you know, the queer bit, or, and I keep joking about this. I tell my students that, you know, I, I probably look good on the departmental faculty webpage, you know, for any college, and, uh, except maybe, uh, well, I can think of a few, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, I mean, so there was no question of me trying to, like, you know, uh, pass, convert or cover, or any of these things, right? I couldn't. 
on the other hand, I've never, I, at the interview, like, I don't think I ever said anything. Like, I didn't articulate anything. And in the six and a half years, almost seven years that I've been at Wagner, I've had at least two situations where other faculty members have said that they didn't realize I was queer identified. One very early on, one not so early on, like noticeably not so early on, like I'm like, uh, and two or three weeks ago, I had to tell a student, I had to actually say, he's like, oh, I wasn't thinking of it. And I'm like, I, I, does, I don't know what, if it's obvious, if it's not, sometimes students say that they're, they're not thinking of it, so. Who knows? I mean, I, I no longer know what the re what what the reality is. But yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and I think that we're hitting on some really really strong points. Especially, um, you know, I know Pat started off by talking about with your mentor and sort of the mask game that sometimes happens when you go in for a job interview. And I know Collins hit on this too, saying like, you know, do I have to come out? That's exactly what you said. Do I have to come out in the job interview, or at what point do I come out? You know, and putting my own experience into it, you know, in the fall, I interned with a government agency, and in the spring now I'm with the gay men's health crisis, which, you know, are very two different work environments. And I love what Tommy said, where, you know, you do that thing, and again, this is very much a mark of privilege in the sense where like, you know, as somebody who is, you know, a white, tall male who, you know, can pass for straight, but it can, you know, that's something that I definitely do feel out. And especially when I was with that agency in the fall, that was a big thing, was kind of with my coworkers, slowly but surely beginning to slip things in. And, you know, thankfully it was a very warm, welcoming environment. But, you know, at GMHC was a totally different story of I knew what I was signing up for because it was in the name itself, what we knew this work environment was going to be. And so I think where I want to go next is I want to now really dig into this idea of coming out to your employer. Now you have the job, and perhaps in the interview you didn't say what your identity was or your identity did not become, quote unquote, obvious to the person who was employing you. Um, when you go into a new work environment, how do you navigate? And how do you say, at what point am I going to be my true self? The identity that I want to and hope to share with this workplace. Or at what point do you say, I'm going to make a concession? I'm not going to share this part of my life. How do you sort of come to that, I guess, how do you determine that would be the question, if anyone wants to pick that up. I'm happy to start I'm going to go back a little bit to something that Tommy said that I think is very much relevant and it has to do with feeling the room. So one thing that I've done, or I shouldn't say feeling the room, I'm sorry, I got this confused. Um, trying to walk that line, but also not coming off as dishonest. Because that's something that people can tell if you don't feel comfortable in a space. It doesn't matter necessarily, like it goes beyond just sexual preference, gender identity, anything like that. People can tell when you're uncomfortable. People can tell when you're not confident in yourself and feeling yourself authentically. So one thing that has been great for me when it's come to this is I do my best to be as open as I can without actually saying anything. So one thing that I've done, I think there's maybe only one day I can count on hand in which I've shown up in a dress because I don't usually do that. And I make it very clear to my, wow, very clear. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a slap. Or was Same it? Same thing. Same thing, or was it? Um, you know, one thing that I've done to make it, you know, fairly clear is I'll even say, like, coming in the next day, one thing I did in coming in the next day was just express how happy I am to be wearing pants again with pockets, like little things like that. like. I wear button-ups, I wear vests, I like come into a space and it's like I move around fairly comfortably. Like, please excuse me for a second. These are men's shoes. I don't really wear heels anymore. I don't like to wear heels. I've never asked to wear heels. I don't wear makeup, I hate to wear makeup. 
And I think maybe it's just the working environment that I'm in, and a majority of my office happen to be women, so we all kind of like understand after a certain point. No one really likes to wear makeup all that much when it's that much effort you put in. Heels hurt. <laughs> well, you can talk. But I mean, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I spoke a little too today. soon on that. Talk. But like, it's there's a lot of effort that goes into it, and for a lot of folks, it's a hassle. And it's like whatever makes you most comfortable and like happy enough in your own skin, like that shows. And if your coworkers notice that you're freer, you're happier, you're more open, you're engaging with them, like it makes a difference. And they want to see that. They want to see you comfortable. They want to be able to work with you and make something wonderful, especially like within my own field, like we're working to bring theater to so many people and create more programming and create more educational opportunities. Like, this is stuff that gets us up in the morning and we want to continually see that. We don't want people to be like uncomfortable or closed off or just not involved because that really like it changes a room. So to have these little concessions subtly and feeling out a room and just to make yourself more open, I really think it subtly makes a difference in a good way and your coworkers start to know you in that way that you're open in that way that you're authentic within the room. And they want to see that, and they want to see that come out of you if they really like working with you. And a majority of times, they do when you're engaged in what you're doing, when you care about what you're doing. That's why you're there. So that's my two cents. I agree with everything Pat just said. I think beyond building your relationships with your coworkers, though, it's also really important to be yourself for yourself because the kind of work you're doing can be as rewarding as anything you could have ever dreamt. But if you're not being yourself, I just don't believe you can be fully happy. And that was something that was very important to me. I sort of tried to feel out how my job was with people. There weren't a ton, a ton of gays at Nielsen, so I didn't want to fall into a stereotype, but I also didn't want to not be. I'm not very subtle about it. I just bleached my hair one day and came back. <laughs> and then that opened up a lot of dialogue. But. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, like I, as I was saying before, I've sort of always moved in, whether it's an academic space or a professional space, I've always moved in LGBT spaces. Um, so it's been less of a, less of a talking point, right? Um, uh, like like um, on my academic CV, people will see my advisor's name and they're like, oh, like, you're, like you're gay, you're doing that work, right? Um, um, so, uh, so that's, so, but I, it's also, I've been very privileged to be able to move in spaces like that. Like I've had friends in other graduate programs, you know, who had wildly different experiences and felt like they had to hide and that sort of stuff. Um, and I've made very intentional choices so that I would never have to. Yeah. So you're talking about, you're in the door, I've figured out my ID, my, my boss knows I'm trans. Now when I go into the office every day, I have been thinking much more about my gender, my gender identity as a gift I get to give other people. So I do not talk about my gender at work and I choose that. So I come in with my nail polish and my floral and kind of beg, like, if you want to ask, you can, but I don't, it is not imperative to my work that I share this. And I, for me, it's about spending my emotional energy. I often, at the, at the DOE, I choose I often choose not to talk about my gender. Um, in a way that I go, I'm happy with who I am and I don't feel the need to present this. That being said, we just started a diversity and inclusion task force. We're trying to get things started. And in that space, I go, aha, I want to talk about this here. I want to share this here. And selfishly, I feel like I don't have to do the emotional work of educating here. I just get to be trans here and that gets to be part of my experience. So for me, it's choosing spaces and it's choosing who gets to know this about me in a way that I see it as giving it to somebody else as an active choice. But it also comes with the privilege of I can pass as cis. You're talking about the like, with people who don't have to think about it, I pass as cis often when I'm not wearing nail polish and when I'm not being fat. Um, so it's a balance, but for me it's about choosing which spaces I show up in. Yeah, I, not to like out myself as the old guy on the panel, but when I started working, like George Bush was president, um, and it was in, in the corporate world, it was a different time where like it, it was not, you know, like it was in the seventies, but it was also I noticed, you know, I, I, early in my career, I worked at Johnson and Johnson, relatively conservative company, and you know they had 
you know, special interest groups and all those things, but I also noticed very quickly that it was the thing that, like, outside of happy hour, you just didn't really talk about. Um, and, you know, like, flash forward to now, I hired an intern last summer who identified as a queer man, and, like, day one on his desk, it was, like, rainbow flag, Lady Gaga picture, like, me and the boyfriend. And I was like, okay, that's where we are now. And, and, and it seems to be that, like, there is that shift now where I think, you know, both generationally and in terms of, like, the corporate world, it's just been embraced and say, like, you know, the way you would talk about your Jack Russell Terrier is also the same way you would talk about your sexual identity. Like, it's all just on, <laughs> it's just all on the same plane. And so that's, it's been interesting to see that in, like, a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, I think it's, I think there's, like, three avenues, right? The avenue one is, I dare you to ask me. Mm. Um, the second avenue is I just talk about it all the time, and then the third avenue is here's my Gaga like frame, and I'm gonna make you look at her just like I look I look at her, right? I think there's there's three kind of and I don't say silos, so that sounds bad, but there's three kind of groups that we generally fall into, and um, and I think that I, at first in my career I came from the I dare you to ask me. And it was almost from a place of defensiveness because I didn't want to be defined by that, by my supervisor, by my peers. And then that shifted in my career where it just kind of became part of my conversation. But on the flip side, I think you have to know that regardless of how you react, you're gonna have reactions to that. So if you're somebody who's openly going to talk about it and then they need a volunteer for the committee to serve on like the you know gay men's history committee and you kind of get the, <laughs> waiting, like, waiting, and then you get the stairs, especially, and I appreciate that you're saying, like, the non-queer spaces, the non-LGBTQ, when there's a group around the table and you may be the only one, and you have to figure out how you're going to react when everybody in the room waits for you to volunteer to lead the Pride Month celebration party in the office, and you have, and I at first got defensive, where I was like, no, it shouldn't be me, it should be, it should be an ally who has to do it, and then I had to calm myself down a little bit internally. <laughs> I want to make sure everybody at the table also knows how to do this and knows how to follow it. So depending on how you go, sometimes they're gonna like look at you slowly. Um, and you have to be okay with that and try not to make that your brand and not volunteering for every LGBTQ plus committee at, a, at an organization. I imagine when you work in the Pride Center, that's difficult, but you know, <laughs> so, so that's hard. Uh, but in sense of like, I'm yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but aside from outside of it, I think that, that that's important, or even mentoring programs when the LGBTQ person starts, and like, you should meet Kevin. Well, why, right? Like, <laughs> is that just for one reason or another? Uh, I'm just like an uptight person in general, <laughs> like, and so I don't know, I don't know anymore. Like, I, I, my, my last book is called Demoralizing Gay Rights, and like, it's so obviously I work on LGBT stuff. I'm the faculty advisor to, to the, to Iris Alliance, I'm, I'm, I teach case law tomorrow, Dan. We're discussing Lawrence versus Texas. Like, I teach sodomy <laughs> laws, like, you know, all this sort of thing. And in spite of that, I have to come out to students on occasion. So I don't, I, I no longer know what the right answer is. Like, I don't regulate, I don't force anything. On the other hand, I think it is obvious, but sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And I don't know. Louise, it was obvious, no, when you took my class? That's right, that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, so I do want to start to steer in the direction because we do have such a big undergrad, uh, undergrad crowd here and because we are putting stuff on the college website, I do want to steer the direction towards um, as a young person just trying to get that position to begin with. Um, but before I do, I do want to continue this laughing high and kind of just wrap up our discussion about being in the workplace by talking about like what some of the better, funner aspects are of being a queer identifying person in the workplace. I know that we have Lisa who um, at the Pride Center, you're certainly you're surrounded by this incredible community who are part of the community. Uh, but then like going back to what Kevin is saying or at the DOE with Collins, and you're starting to deal with, um, you know, maybe a setting where there aren't as many queer identifying people. Um, can we maybe talk a little bit about, um, as a queer identifying person, what are some of the funner, you know, better aspects of that? So I think uh, one of my favorites, this is completely novel, but like whenever a new person starts and people don't know how they identify, but they maybe have a suspicion, you're the first person they come to. It always comes up, like, they try to like stealthily work it in a conversation, like it's the weather, and oh, did you see what happened on Grey's Anatomy? And then it's like, oh, so like, have you met Brian? Like, he's interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and it's always an adjective like that, or like, oh, yeah, he's so eccentric. <laughs> I love his shoes. 
I'm, and I like first like I try not to like steer into that. I'm always like, yes, he does have nice shoes. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going back to work now um, because I think like you just you don't know what anybody else's journey is. And, like, if, and if I don't know how that person identifies, or I don't know how that person wants to be identified, then like that's you know that's your your mission, and I sort of leave that be. But it's always entertaining because you're the first person they'll come to. I will say, at least from my experience, the one thing that has been like the biggest sigh of relief when it's come to working in a new place is finding other queer people who happen to be there. And it's, it's one of those kinds of situations where, you know that magic moment where you end up like coming into a room and you just kind of recognize someone on the side of it like, oh, hello, you're here too. <laughs> just like that sort of feeling ends up like coming in and it's I guess it's like a, a little bit of an intuitive thing and part of that's maybe just like a learned thing when it comes to like the things that you pick up in trying to register other people to recognize in a new space oh I'm safe because you're here like that kind of thing and I had that experience maybe like the first week in when it came to this new position and I just kind of remember sitting in the green room and like they slowly start to trickle in and I just felt just a wash of relief and just being able to like, you know, I was still nervous about the new job, that kind of thing. Like, you know, oh, I don't want to do anything wrong. Oh, I'm hope I'm shredding the right files, all oh, this kind of stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, like, and upon seeing these people come in, they just, there's just something that's really calming about seeing someone who's older and more experienced and also like knows what you're going through in a new position like knows what it's like to be that new person and to also experience these kinds of things and live this kind of life so like i've made a few connections like very subtly within workplaces in that kind of way and it's just always a sigh of relief to just like find more of these people to help you get connected within the community, like in the surrounding area. Like I just moved for this job too. Like I'm in my first apartment, like I'm living on my own. Like it's kind of scary and I don't know where I can go to find a bunch of places. And so when you find these people who know this area well, and they're just like, oh, we should go to this place at some point because I think you're really gonna like it. I'm surprised that you've never been here before. It's such a treat. Like this is such a great area for queer folks. It's so thriving, like that kind of thing. It's such a relief to have that. And I think that's one little blessing that like has come along the way that I can't really describe it in any other way. Like I have nothing to compare it to. I would say for me, it's like, again, I'm working in, in an LGBT space, but um, like for, for me, I, t I try to think about Staten Island. So I, I grew up on Staten Island. Staten Island has not is not known as like a gay place, right? We think that like gay life happens in Manhattan, right? Over there, um, or in Brooklyn, over there, right? Um, uh, but gay life happens right here, right? Um, uh, and so uh, for me, it's about like, w when I grew up here, there was no Pride Center of Staten Island. There was no LGBT center. There, there was, you know, um, I remember watching, this is gonna sound super cheesy. Uh, it was a documentary, it was a long time ago. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell does these like gay family cruises and there's a documentary about it. And um, uh, Wayne and Sal, there were these two guys who were on it and they were like, we're from Staten Island, New York. And I was like, what? <laughs> like there are other gay people on Staten Island? Like, like, like I, was, I was like 12 when I was like watching this thing so like that was like mind blown right um, uh, um, but but yeah so for me it's about like like how can I as a gay person who has grown up on Staten Island um, like make Staten Island gay friendlier right make Staten Island a little gayer every day um, and, and, and help people remember that it's not like an across the water thing it's like an on these shores kind of thing so. very nice um, yeah, I definitely, um, I remember that documentary too. And one of my favorite parts was when Rosie O'Donnell saying, I was born in a dish about in vitro fertilization. Oh. And it was like her grating vocals in this like camping. Oh my God, that was such a great documentary. Anywho, um, <laughs> hopping back onto the train. Um, so let's go back now, back to where we were when we were in undergrad. Um, and I think that the first question that I want to ask is um, something that so many of us are going through right now is you know you have all these job listings online and these terrible application portals where you apply for a thousand jobs and you don't hear from any of them and then you're you know maybe you get a phone interview here and there and it's impossible to navigate um, can we maybe go down and whether you want to talk about perhaps your internship experience or work experience 
during your undergrad time or just at, right after college, what kind of got you there? Um, what are your tips, tricks, and suggestions when it comes to um, sort of navigating that really big minefield that is um, the uh, sort of the job application process? Yeah. I'm trying to think of good words for this because I was literally just there not so long ago. Um, the one thing that I will say is it can be very demoralizing <laughs> just applying to several different places at a time in these online portals that make you, you know, upload your resume and at the same time you have to edit your resume and then after that you have to plug in everything from your resume again and it just seems like a never ending hell and it just, it's one of those things where if you don't hear back, you can't take it personally because it happens. Like a lot of the time when it comes to the screening process for each of these things, there are little bots that HR uses to get keywords when it comes to your resume. And sometimes like your resume is not written well enough, or sometimes it's just, there are circumstances outside of your control. Sometimes you can make the best possible cover letter, the best possible resume you can present to sell yourself as well as possible. And they may be like a dream company for you and you may not hear back from them and that hurts. But you know what? It is their loss at the end of the day in that they didn't see your potential. And the folks that do end up seeing your potential, because they'll come along. It takes a long time to find them and match up with them. And a lot of it's luck and happenstance if it does come along. Once they find you, they'll look for your strengths and they'll also look at your weaknesses and see, you know what? Is it worth investing the time in you to help you build on those weaknesses? And in those cases, it is. Because it makes you a better worker. It makes you thrive within any sort of job that you're looking for. And it's, it's important just to come through with that. And in some cases, when you make a good impression within an interview, you can connect with these people still. You may not work with them, but you can still say, hey, I would like to remain in contact with you to see what other opportunities you're doing, or like other opportunities that you have, like where the company's moving forward, because I do have an interest in this place. If I didn't have an interest in this place, then I wouldn't have gotten this far within the interview process with you. Like, it's stepping stones. Like, you can turn all of these obstacles that you can face when it comes to a job search into different opportunities in connecting with all of these places. Because within your industry, it's a smaller world than you think a lot of the time. And everyone, to a certain degree, knows other people. And they may say, hey, we don't necessarily have a position for you here, but I know another company who we're connected with that does have this kind of position that may be looking for someone with your skill set, probably is looking for someone with your specific set of skills. Let me refer you over to them. Like, it's all about continuing to make the effort because a lot of the times it's not personal. It's just a process and it's frustrating, but you gotta keep doing it. That's what it really comes down to. And also be very wary of online portals that ask you specific questions regarding your gender identity or your sexual preference because you don't have to provide that information in an application ever. So don't, so. I think when you think about the job search, one of the things that, yeah, I get the opportunity to work with predominantly undergrads here, and use the time that you have now to ask why you didn't get the job in this office. Ask for feedback. If you aren't asking for feedback, you're doing something wrong. You know, I use an example, we just went through our RA selection process, and my heart was like elated that I had about 20 people ask why I didn't get the job. Also, if you get the job, ask, what about my application made me stand out? And what about it could make me improve more? You know, no one that I hired for next year has asked how they could improve. It's, it's in these moments, especially within like the college world, that you get the opportunity to learn so much more about what you did right and what you did wrong and use the opportunity now. You are here, you are part of the community, like ask, 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 ask. Because when you go into the, the professional world, I still to this day ask what I can do better. Like, if I don't get a job, I'll send an email. Thank you so much for the opportunity. If it's appropriate according to your HR, I'd love to hear about what went well, what maybe didn't go well, and you know, best of luck, I'm glad you found the right candidate. 90% of the time, they never respond. 
that's just the reality. They never respond. But that 10% of the time, that one time somebody says, you don't answer the questions fully. You say, um, too much. You seem disinterested. It's these things that you can think about and reflect on. I think that's the thing that'll make you stand out when you're in the entry level search and use those things when you have internships now. Ask for honest, real feedback. What do you do well? What don't you do well? What can I improve on? And find supervisors and mentors who are gonna tell you the truth. If your supervisor says you're great, they're lying to you and they're not a good supervisor. I supervise nine people. I've never told them that they're perfect at their job. Some of them are in this room. I've never said you're perfect. I've said like, you're really good at this. Let's work on this because that's my job as a supervisor and challenge your supervisors to say, if I'm doing this badly, do it now. I think that's, that's what's gonna round you out and make you stand out a little bit more and don't be the person who asks for feedback and then gets hurt by it. Like, accept it and move up and get over it. Like, you, you did a bad job? Okay, you didn't get a job. Not, but that's from my vantage point. But hearing you talk about that makes me think job, applying to jobs is a skill. It is a practice learned skill. You can be phenomenal at applying for jobs and getting jobs and terrible at the job. But like, it, is a different, it is a different set of skills. Um, so asking for that feedback, taking that feedback, learning from it um, is great. My kind of two pieces of advice, one is specific for trans and gender nonconforming folks, apply with the name you want to be called. You can always correct someone later. If it's going to help your personal anxiety and figuring out how you want to be in that space, apply with, apply with who you, how you want to be, and then you can have the conversation. Oh, I had, um, um, it's gone. Oh, let people know you're applying. If you, are in a, if you are in a position and you're looking to transition or you're just looking for something else, people don't know that you're looking, especially if you're actively talking about the job you currently have. Say, hey, I am looking for something in blank. Do you have any advice for me? Do you have anyone I should talk to? Talk about the fact that you are looking. And part of that can be a publicity thing of, I don't want it to get back to my employer that I am looking, so you have to be strategic. Strategic, thank you. Um, but part of it is just, you never know who someone knows. So if you put it out there, I might not have someone you can talk to, but I might know someone whose partner is at the yada, 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 the world is small. Um, so make it, you know. Just to amplify some other things that have been said, like, like you were talking about like using your time as a student and like intern as much as you possibly can. Um, even the, uh, uh, also make sure that you're, as, when you're interning, make sure that you are benefiting as much as the company is benefiting. Your internship needs to be mutually beneficial. But I, like, I interned like every summer between college. Uh, my mom was like, my poor mother, she was like, are you ever gonna like, let someone pay you to do work? Right. Uh, uh, but but it, like, a lot of things that internships did for me too is it, it helped me figure out what I didn't wanna do. You know, like I, I was like when I, I was a theater major and I was like, I'm going to be a stage manager for life. It's going to be great. And then I had like a couple of stage management internships and I was like, this is not, this is not the thing. Um, uh, so, so, so it can be, it's help, it can be either confirmatory or it can help you say like, no, this is not, this is not it. Um, and also like, just remember like your, your self-worth is not linked to your performance on the job market, right? Um, sometimes there are other things going on. Like I graduated in 2000, college in 2009. Right, it, it, like in 2008, like the world was collapsing, um, and so the job market was not awesome. Uh, so it's it's not, and I I mean I learned that again after I finished graduate school with like the adjunctification of the university, right? Like it, I was like it's it's not it's it's not it's not me, right? That's not to say that you shouldn't take like accountability for your application materials and that kind of stuff, yeah. right? You should, um, but you have to like not not tie your self worth into that. Um, you it, it, uh, the other thing I would say is like job applications and interviewing processes, it's your time to tell, help other people understand what's awesome about you. So you have to like, figure out how to narrate that for other people. You may, you may know it, but how are you gonna communicate that to others is I think a key part of it, so. I, I would say that to build on your advice on internships, like there are, do as many as you can, like paid and unpaid, like obviously you have bills and masters, but uh, I think one thing like in, in PR marketing we get a lot is that people don't want to do internships after they've graduated. They're like, well, I'm not a student anymore. I can't be an intern. But the reality is like we like that's how we hire entry level employees because like you call it an internship, I call it a two month job interview. Because yeah. um, I can find out a lot more in two months than I can in sixty minutes sitting with you, um, and like it's paid. So it's it, you have to sort of like 
look at the long term, not the short term. Um, and I think internships, even if you know you complete it and there's not a job for you, like stay in touch. Like don't let the internship end there because you never know what's going to happen two months later. So just like keep in contact, LinkedIn, like email, whatever it is, because things change quickly. Um, so I finished my PhD in 2008. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like that fall semester. Yeah. So yep. I know what I you're talking you. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it was, it was hellish. I went through the ringer up. <laughs> but but I, I, I want to say something to which there is no right answer, but I very strongly feel a couple things, so I'm going to tell you anyway. And it's, I, Pat, I'm going to slightly disagree about one thing, and that is this. If there is, if someone's asking you for gender identity data, and I know I just taught some material, the FAFSA form does ask you, and they do actually have a little thing saying, there is another place where you can explain if you're transitioning or, or if, you, if there is something that you want to explain about your gender identity. I would say answer that question for a reason. When we don't answer questions like that, we can't see if there is an HR, if there is a sexist HR group sitting there only interviewing men, for example. Mm. Right? Unless you collect the data, you can't see if there is discrimination. Do you see what I'm saying? For that reason, I think the data is important. And I understand, if you have a conscientious objection to it, obviously don't do it. But that data, from the point of administrative rationality, like the state, when it collects the data, it's not always a bad thing. So, so and I'll give you an example. The French don't collect race data, for example, when they're um, arresting people. So, so if there is disproportionate arrests of like you know North African French people like in Algerians, Mor Moroccans, Tunisians, whatever, you don't get to see that on paper because they're not collecting the ethnic and racial identity data. So the data is a tricky thing. So it, just be mindful of that. That's one thing. The se the second thing is, and this is something that I personally feel, if you get a chance to signal that you are not a member of the dominant mainstream when it comes to sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics, do it. If you can somehow show, signal, that you're part of the LGBT plus community, do it. I'm saying this for a reason. There might be someone in the HR office looking at your thing saying, wow, another person like me. It might be. On the other hand, it could be a deeply homophobic organization at which you don't want to work, right? You don't want to work there, you don't want to meet them, you, don't, you want them to reject you right off the bat. What you don't want is to go into that interview thing and they look at you and they're, immediately they lower their eyes like, I'm not gonna hire you. You don't want to be in that situation. So signal if you can, I think. This is my, reasonable people can disagree about this approach. This is my approach. So if you can signal, I think you should signal. And I would add to, we live, and this, you have to think about this when you're applying to jobs in different geographic areas. We have, at the city and state level, protections against like job housing discrimination, right? For LGBTQ people. Um, that's not to say discrimination doesn't happen, but that means that you should have some kind of recourse when it does, right? And that's dicey in and of itself. But it, like, like, for instance, there was a time when I was applying to jobs, like again, on the academic job market, and like, Georgia or Virginia or like like places like that and I had to think like is this actually like a safe place for my wife and I to go uh, not that there aren't queer people in those places there are right um, uh, and like do and are there like legal protections in place do in certain places too it was like do the um, does like the benefits policy uh, support like a same-sex couple and that sort of stuff are you able to access benefits for your partner um, other things that you might want to think about are different kinds of like transition services uh, covered by that place's insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Like these are all like choices that you that that may factor into your search and your decision making process. Um, so those are just some depending on the the how broad the net you are casting geographically is. These are some things that may come into play. So I can definitely resonate with that. I'm from Virginia, so most of my job application was throughout the South, and then I did a little bit up north and. The job market's terrifying enough, applying for jobs. I'm sure all of you are very scared. I was a year ago, it was horrible. But we also have to think about things like you said, am I gonna be safe here? Am I gonna get to be myself at work? It's something that I think a lot of people don't have to think about and that's overlooked. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanna underscore the importance of perseverance because I know there's gonna be a lot of rejection letters and I got the corniest advice when I was very down on 
my job search, but it actually worked. It was like, you can get 99 rejections, you just need one yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You just need the one job. I don't want you all to forget that. Absolutely. Yeah, so before I um, turn it over to our audience to ask a couple questions, um, I do want to round it out um, by saying, I know came up quite frequently when we were talking about what you should be doing during your undergrad years. Um, but hindsight is 2020. So when you look back at your undergrad experience and you think about what you did and what you wish you had done, um, what do you think are the clubs, extracurriculars, work opportunities? What should undergrad students be going for, um, particularly as an LGBTQ identifying person or even not, um, to set them up for success when they do go out into the world and try to find employment? I came from a very funny situation that I went to an all-girls high school and then a historically, I went to Mount Holyoke, which is a historically women's college. So I had a very funny thing of knowing I was trans, uh, going into Mount Holyoke and graduating going, well, I chose this school because it was the queerest place I'd ever been. And I saw people like me and I felt people, it was, it was phenomenal. But leaving, having to go, I'm gonna have to explain me and my college. So what a little bit what I wish I'd done and what I did in a funny way was I created my own major that incorporated a lot of classes at UMass Amherst. And so I created a way for me to say, I went to UMass three days a week for, for much of my college career. And so for me, it was a funny line of creating a situation where if I needed the the space to be stealth and to not come out, I had a, enough of that. And that's a very specific situation and not applicable to Wagner grads, and I recognize that. Um, so I am both proud of myself for creating that, that pocket um, and often challenge myself, well, why do I feel the need to hide this college that I'm so excited to have gone to? Um, and so, uh, I think I danced around the question, <laughs> but um, so, so it's it's self work. It's self work of I wish I'd, I'd done a little more work to be proud of my space and project that to others. And I'm proud for creating a get out of jail free card for my women's college. You know, I taught at Mount Holyoke. Yeah. Yeah. Just before I, well, I came to Wagner, I taught one year at Mount Holyoke. Yeah. Cool. It's yeah. a very cool place. <laughs> Well, they have the most expensive gender definitions on their uh, official college policy now mm. of all the, uh, you know, not just the five college, but the seven. Yeah. yeah. So I think for me, in terms of things I wish I did a little bit different in undergrad, uh, I, wish I, ha I wish I listened more when people told me what I should be doing. I don't think I was great at comprehending what they were saying as much as just letting go in one ear and out the other. And I think if I look back, what I wish I did was that I asked folks to mentor me. I think I assumed people were mentoring me, but you need to have that dialogue with someone and have it be somebody in the career path you're interested in, but also have it be someone who you see on campus or you see in an internship who you aspire to have a professional attribute like, because they'll be the type of people who will match what you need to hear you know, if you're, if you're really interested in going into theater, you can ask a faculty member to mentor you, but make sure there's somebody who really wanna answer it. But make sure, and make sure the mentor, and I think it's also make sure the mentor is someone who's going to answer the phone when you call. Sometimes folks are like, I have 100 people who I mentor. Where is that the truth? But have someone who, when stuff goes down, you can call them and say, this is going on, I need an objective, unbiased, like tell me how it is opinion. I wish I did that more, because when I got to grad school, and grad school is hard. When you're leaving from undergrad and you're not sure if you're doing entry level, not sure to go to grad school, you're navigating this weird world. And then I left to go into my first entry level job, and I had something occur that was not appropriate, and I wish I had someone to call. Because if somebody called me, I would not have taken a job I took if I knew who I had to call. And I was just like, oh, this must just be the way it is that someone will ask me a question regarding my sexual orientation in a meeting and, and, and somewhat hit on me. And I thought that was normal. And then I wish, I look back on it, and I'm like, if one of my grads called me and did this, I'd be like, run for the hills. I'm like, I have grad searching right now, and I'm like, don't apply there, that, that's a bad place. Um, but you know, it's, I think you have to balance those, those different things, but ask people to mentor you, ask people to help you out, and, and be okay if they, if they say no. They, they never will, though. 
if, especially if you ask them and sit down with them and want to talk. And to, like, one, one key way to do that, and something that I wish that I had done in my own undergraduate career, go to office hours. Like I didn't, like there were some classes that I was taking where I was like, I don't, I don't need like extra help or I don't need like some kind of extra push or something. But it's more about like building a relationship with that human. Your professor is a person, right? Um, and so like when I, was, when I was teaching, I loved when students would come to office hours. I, it was like an opportunity not only to discuss like material that I was passionate about and they may have been passionate about, right? Um, but it was an opportunity to get to know that student and for them to get to know me a little bit. Um, and so, uh, and, uh, like I, like I was lucky too where like I, I went to, to Williams, uh, Williams College in Massachusetts and they, um, they work um, sometimes frequently on like a tutorial system where it's like you, another student, and a professor, right? And so I had that sort of like built into the structure where I was like developing close relationships with certain professors anyway so that I, I even if I wasn't going to office hours, I, I had a different level of access to certain people. I think for like for me to... Uh, it was, a, when I was teaching, I did frequently out myself, right? I would say, oh, I live at home with like my, my partner, her name is Terry, and our dog, right? Or something like that. Um, and, it, and it was something I did sort of like casually on the first day when I introduced myself, because I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, how important it was to have out queer faculty to, to show that like, oh, there are queer people doing like big professional important things. Um, that was super important to me. I, but I realized too, that's not everyone's professional practice, and that's okay. Um, uh, but but yeah, but go to office hours and and yeah, to just amplify that what you were saying there. Um, fi find your find your mentor, and that's and it's something that should happen like like naturally, right? Um, and no one's going to say like, hey, I'm your mentor, right? <laughs> like no one's going to say to but you, like but you can kind of like you like you figure out you develop a feeling for like oh this is someone I can turn to, right? While there's certainly an importance with office hours with finding that mentor, I found that my biggest regret was focusing, not focusing on the opposite, sort of building myself outside of my college. College is great, but it shouldn't be your everything even when you're there. You want to show employers that you can conduct yourself in the real world, whether it be an internship or with the work you do with volunteer groups, different clubs, so forth, so on. It's just, I was very focused on my college. I was like, I love it here. I love this environment. I love having my mentors. But then you kind of lose out on something, too. Well, I was going to say my first regret was going to Wagner, but I don't think that really counts well in this room. <laughs> but it's not really a regret. I don't regret going here. Um, but I did have a couple of things that come into my mind about how I handled my undergraduate experience that really, like, I don't regret the journey I've been on with it, but had I learned about it sooner, it probably would have saved me a lot of trouble. Um, so in coming in, I thought, you know, the best thing is to be okay with looking like a fool because when you come in as a freshman, like, you really, all you know is really nothing and so you're expected to learn. But don't write yourself, don't write yourself off as a fool the whole time. Don't write yourself off by, like, all of your weaknesses because in some cases, the things that you perceive as weaknesses can be cultivated into strengths. Like, for so long, all of the different attributes that I had that I thought were bad and that I t was taught were bad were all things that kind of tie into me being queer. <laughs> like the sensitivity, the over the top kinds of behaviors, just my sense of humor in a lot of ways. Like I used to think that these were weaknesses and things that I should work to change. But in learning more about myself, I started to understand this is what made people want to be around me and want to work with me and see what's special about me as an individual. So in realizing that and like coming to terms with that kind of stuff, I feel like that's, that's something that I had to learn within my journey, but at the same time, had I figured it out sooner, it would have saved me a lot of trouble. <laughs> so just coming to terms with yourself and trying to look at your weaknesses and see are they really weaknesses? Like reevaluate how you look at yourself. Like continually reevaluate how you look at yourself and start to think, am I being too harsh? Is the information coming to me helping me understand how I treat myself and how I view myself in these contexts? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and we do have some incredible, I mean, everyone on this panel is absolutely incredible and people that we can all look towards for inspiration. And especially for the Wagner students here in the house, I do want to point out on the end over here, um, Dr. Ghosh and Tommy, um, who are just both incredible um, mentor figures uh, for so many of us and people that we turn to. Um, Tommy has set me straight more than once, and I can definitely say that. So that's that. <laughs> Um, so I would like to turn it now over to the audience um, for questions. If anyone has any questions for the panel, yeah. Um, I think a lot of the times I've been talking to other people who are in the middle of like their applications as a senior and all that craziness is um, there's this tendency to like lean on things like Indeed, things that just list things out, like list all these job opportunities because we're all in a BuzzFeed culture of like everything needs to be put in a list by somebody else, like by somebody who's paid to curate it for me. Um, do you have any recommendations about like people about opportunities and ways of like getting out there and finding actual job listings that aren't just the ones that come up when you Google it. Because um, I think that's relevant to a lot of that first steps of your job search anyways. The best advice I got was make, once you figure out what you want to be doing, which is a big step in the to start with, um, <laughs> make your list of this is the dream, this is, this is the place I want to work at. And send the cold email, hey, I'm graduating, I'm interested. I, it's not, it's very, it's very specifically not asking for a job, but it's, what are the steps? Are there people I can talk to? What advice can you give? Um, it's very, it's, it's a way of saying, hello, I'm here and interested, and you don't know where it can lead. So in terms of, you don't know what's not posted, and it's a way of potentially making a connection. And Probably you're not going to get a response, but the, it's the 10% of the time you do, it's a start with something, and maybe it's a, it's all about being a person and finding the other people even in organizations. And I would say to build on that, like network, network, and then when you're tired, like network a little bit more. Because like, you kind of hit on this with mentorship. Like when you're a student, like no one's going to say no to you, like a networking opportunity. When you're just like a person with no job, I'm going to be like, I don't have time for that. Um, so like use that advantage now. And like if you, if you can figure out your way in like through somebody you know, like you mentioned, great. Like if not, then like you said, send the cold email, like make the introduction, connect on LinkedIn. Like a lot of the times you're going to get nothing in response, but sometimes, you know, somebody might be interested and then whether there's a job then or in the future like you, I'm gonna have seven names that are just names on a resume and then you who I have an email from so like I'm gonna start with you so any advantage you can create in New York where you know the opportunities are more but also like the candidates are more um, you know that's it's a leg up that you can get pretty easily I had a list of jobs that I kept in a bind, I get printed out and put in a binder <laughs> that I wasn't qualified for. <laughs> um, and I actually just recently, in like cleaning out my office, found it and printed out jobs that I saw that I was like, I want to do this one day. And I looked at the skills that was needed. And then I made sure that any of the jobs that I was looking for matched those things. So much so I had an Excel document and it was like coded, you know, like I needed these certain things. That's why my mind works. But I think you have to think of what job do you want in 10, 15, 20 years? And like you know, some mentioned, the path might change, but what's gonna put you on the path to success now? And I'll go back to my previous thing. That's why you need mentors who are outside of your field, because I think of some people, I had one, one, we have one staff member who wanted to go and get some type of public relations. She came forward and said, I know your future husband at the time works in this, can I go get coffee with him? And she went into the city and had coffee with him. Nothing came out of it, but the connections, and, and she sent his resume and like had that conversation. He put it in the HR database, right? I, we have a friend that works, used to work for the Colbert, and now he works for Jesus and, and, Miro. and Miro, sorry. Uh, but right, like people have asked me to connect them with them, but I think it's all about connections. If you're just gonna use somebody for a connection, I'm not gonna be as inclined to connect you. Like I'm not. But if you put in the work, if you want to get to know like me, if I get to know you, then I can say, oh, like at least a cool person. Like let me introduce her to somebody this way. It's all about that networking and mentoring and building that up. But when you're looking at those jobs, even if you think it's a bot job, 
print, put it in your dream folder if you're like, this skill works, or I have no skills in this functional area, and this is the entry level job, like SOS. Um, what do I do to get these skills in my last, you know, for you, like 10 weeks, or, you know, whatever it might be. And that's why I start looking early. If you're a junior, you should really start looking at jobs casually to make sure you're building up for that. I think that's the, that's the biggest piece of advice I would have, is have your dream book ready to go. Yeah, that's fabulous advice. That's really good. Like, like, um, uh, I did, and I was going to say something else entirely. I know I'm not remembering what it was, so maybe we can come back to you. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Okay. So one thing that I will say for Wagner College, your case office, fantastic resource. Absolutely a fantastic resource. After I'd graduated, I would go back and forth between case while I was applying for jobs just to see what I could do that would get me a more specific position within the field that I was interested in. I came in with a plan and what I wanted and an idea of where I wanted to go, and they were able to work with me and figure out what I could do with my resume to keep it updated, what sites to look at when it came to a specific job. Because one thing that is important is where, what software you're using to, excuse me, <laughs> What software you're using to apply, what sites you're using to apply. Because yeah, you can find the listings on Indeed, yeah, you can do a Google search and see the postings that are online, but sometimes you just don't see enough within your field. And part of the reason might be is because you're not looking in the right place. Like once I was introduced to Idealist for not-for-profit work, for government work, for philanthropic work, fantastic resource. I ended up finding a job like that. I got into interviews like that. It was really a huge game changer for me because otherwise I would have been sitting on Indeed and I would have been sitting on like Google searches and I would have been trying to apply to corporate jobs through LinkedIn and like losing my freaking mind. <laughs> like it makes a difference. So I would say use the case office while you can and figure out the different resources to work with from there because they will help you find a job. They are very good at what they do and they will teach you what you can do in order to find these kinds of jobs that you're after. I want to go back to what Mike said when you were talking about like how you want to get off campus and you want to start to build credit for yourself. And that's the big thing too, I think, is street credit because I'll tell a quick anecdote that Elise knows very well. Um, my sophomore year, my first semester, um, I discovered GMHC, which is the company I'm interning with now. And I said to myself, like, this is the company that I want to work for. This is everything that I'm about. I want to be in their legal division, but you can't get into their legal division unless you're a law student. Those are the only people that they're bringing in. So I said, okay, I can get into their policy department. So I started applying every single semester um, to their intern email, and I couldn't get through. And it was impossible for me to get anything back from them. So what I started to do was I started to say, well, then I'm going to have to just build some credit and start, instead of just reaching out for internships, start updating them on the work that I'm doing here at Wagner. So for example, we hosted a um, mock um, blood drive where, because um, there's the MSM, um, you can't donate blood um, if you're gay, uh, queer identifying male. And so we had a uh, mock blood drive on campus where we did this whole petition and tabling event and we really got out there and I sent all that stuff to their office and still I couldn't get in. <laughs> and I reached out to Lisa, um, who I had made a connection with by that point and was you know, starting to develop a relationship. And um, I was really struggling to find someone until finally, oddly enough, the way I finally got through the door <laughs> was over the summer I was interning with a crisis center, like a response center out on the island. Well, I said the island, Staten Island, Long Island. <laughs> I'm from Long Island, but I was out there on Long Island and I was on a panel um, for Governor Cuomo and the Epidemic 2020 whole AIDS thing. And a guy from Hofstra University, he was the head of their biology department specializing in medicine. Um, he had a connection to GMHC and all the outreach work that they did. And so finally, this was someone who I wasn't even working for his organization, but I was on a panel that meant once a month. And finally, I got my way through the door. And this is after everything I had done on campus, short of hosting We Love GMHC Day. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was doing backflips for these people, and I still wasn't getting seen. But finally, I had an in. And again, it's an unpaid internship, but I can honestly say like this was something that was over two years in the making just to get a foot through the door. And they're absolutely incredible. And no matter where I end up in the fall, if I end up going to law school, if I end up going straight into the workforce, um, they're definitely a connection and an organization that I hope to be full-time with um, soon enough. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? 
Yeah. Um, over face discrimination in the workplace that um, was specifically in regards to identity, whether it be sexual or um, gender, and if that was the case, how did you handle it? Was it professional? Um, did you stay in that job? Did you leave that job? Was it on a more personal level with another coworker? How was that? If it were to happen, how was that handled? I was in a, this, I, I don't know if this is exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about, but I was in a professional environment that was blatantly sexist. Um, and, uh, and I talked to the executive director and I like, I, I just, well one, I said something in like a larger meeting and then I approached, followed up with him privately and I was like, I don't know if you're aware, but this is the dynamic that's going on. And then he said, oh, I hope I'm not a part of it. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to say you are. <laughs> um, I, like I felt, I felt um, maybe bold enough and secure enough in my place there and in the expertise that I brought that I, I felt safe enough to, to call that person out. Um, and, and there were, I w and I also made it clear that I was not the only employee experiencing that dynamic. Um, and there were, there were efforts to change the culture. Um, so that's, I don't know that that's precisely what you're getting at, but that was something that was in the air, for sure. I want to um, jump actually off of that, and this is just a question that I want to offer. Um, in terms of what do you do, because I know that you had that, that dialogue with that employee, that colleague who you had that terrible, unfortunate incident with. And then I know that Tommy before was talking about how sometimes when you go into a work environment or you're, you know, exploring a job, you know, that's a sign to quote unquote run for the hills. And so what do you do when you go in for a job, you're in the organization and you want to see things improve and you actively want to be the person that can make things better? What happens when, let's say, that you notice perhaps the HR department is lacking and what they could be doing to serve this community? and to make a better work environment for all. Um, do any of you have experience at being in an organization and getting to watch it grow in the way that they um, work with a certain community? Yeah, I, I think HR not doing a good job, or like let's say for example, you go into a new job and your colleagues surrounding you, you notice that perhaps it's not the best climate to be working in. Um, but you feel like you can either be the change or let's say that you've been with an organization long enough that you've watched the change happen and move towards a more positive place for people to be able to work with them. Um, can you speak to that at all as to what that experience actually, is like? It's, it depends on the context actually, even with that. So I, 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 there's so many things I want to say, but I can't. So I'll say a few things. You want to be careful about the specific thing that not just you. Person X needs to be careful about what it is that they are saying because this, is, this goes into legal terrain, yes. and evidence seems important at that point. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, you should say that you're feeling uncomfortable. But if you can't prove that the discomfort is the result of homophobia, to take one example, don't say it's homophobia. I'm just giving you this advice. Because once you say homophobia, somebody's going to say, prove it the burden of proof suddenly is on you. But if you're uncomfortable, you can say you're uncomfortable. So be careful about the language you use because the world is, it's war, right? So that's one thing. The other is, depending on the context, uh, if HR is actually doing its job, then I would say go to HR. There's all this workplace stuff that we, we have to, how do I say this, that we do the training for the, for, and. It tells you repeatedly, do not be a bystander. If it's something's happening to somebody else, step in. Go to HR, go on their behalf. Actually, you can also say, I was uncomfortable because it's a hostile work environment. I, it wasn't me that was the victim, but I happened to be in the room. So do bring it up with HR. If HR is not doing its job, that becomes trickier. Then you have to think about, well, what are my options? And depending on the context and the institution, my field is very different, like I'm an academic, I would go to my provost, right? If I felt like HR was not doing its job, I'd go to my provost and I'd say, well, HR is not doing its job, now you do yours as my, I'm your direct report, you need to intervene. If you don't, then I have a complaint against you. So it depends on the terrain and the context, so there's no one answer to that, actually, to you too, Dan, there's no one answer. On the other hand, you can also say, I, 
it has come to, I can't go to the non-HR people either because it's really a toxic environment, at which point you may consider you know, calling the National Labor Relations Board or the Equal Employment, EEOC, it depends, right? So everything depends, there's no one answer to any of these questions, so a lot of it depends. And going back to one of the things I just want to underscore, this is where all the mentors that we've been talking about, those mentors come in handy. Because that's when you make that phone call and say, you know what, this is happening to me in the workplace, and they'll say, okay, let's think about this, right? So all this stuff comes together, because you, we can't function alone. Like, this stuff is not easy to ma maneuver, negotiate, you know, uh, manipulate on your own. So you want to do it in solidarity with others. That's and, what I would say. And I would add, too, that like your own, like thinking about your own positionality in the larger organizational or institutional context is really important. Like, um, are you like entry level, like, uh, I, I don't want to use the word disposable because that's not right, but like, um, Replace. yeah, is the, organi is the organization just like as invested in you as you are in them? Like, and, that, and that's like the, you have to decide like, am I in a position where I am, where I have the right um, allies, the right people who, are, who will support me through a case or through, you know, whether it's like an HR case or something much larger, um, or is it time to exit the organization and, and go somewhere else? Uh, and that's gonna be very like individual context kind of specific, but something that you have to think about carefully. It, it, do, you add, do you imagine that you're in a place where change is possible or you're like, no, this is actually not, not the battle I wanna fight today. I'm gonna go take my skills and go somewhere where I am valued, right? I'm really glad you asked this question because I think it's a very hard one, but it's one that at some point it's probably going to impact all of us. Personally, I did experience workplace discrimination, not where I am now, but an earlier previous job back when I was still in the South. It was a family-owned company, very blatant homophobia. There wasn't a ton of gray area. It was pretty obvious what was happening. <laughs> the HR person was related to the person who was doing it, so mm -hmm. you can attempt to be the change, but sometimes the greatest act of resistance is self-preservation. you got to know when you're not going to mm -hmm. win. I will say to kind of go off of something I said earlier, I, I mentioned that I had essentially been sexually harassed by someone in a position of power after my hiring, pre my onboarding, via a social media platform. And the response was, well, this is what gay men do. And it, it almost made me leave the path that I was on. This is just me being honest. Now, now that I'm, I work with Title IX here at the college, I'm very passionate about ensuring that we don't just look at you know heterosexual relationships here, but the intricacies of the LGBTQ community and the sexualization that exists and the confusion that is there, right? The stereotype that I have to experience on gay men are promiscuous and that this is okay. Same thing of very specifics regarding women who identify as lesbian or women go into the trans community, right? There's these different sort of entities there and a, oh, well, like, this is how your community works, and that's okay. And that's something that as you move through a position of power, as you build your career, it's important that you set those precedents and those goals very clearly. I am very passionate that that does not happen with anyone under my employee, and people know that very much of me, that I will, I will as Anne's Conception says, die on that hill. I will fight there because I remember what it was like to be an entry-level employee who didn't have a job, who was waiting for a job to start, that then had this message on Snapchat and said, what do I do? And I had no one. And it was hard because I, I wasn't out in undergrad. I didn't come out in undergrad, so I came out in grad school. I didn't have these mentors that a lot of you have a leg up on some folks who, even at this college. So I think when you're looking at that, you have to make a decision in that moment, like I said earlier, do I want to eat or do I want to fight this? And I had to make this decision and I, to be transparent, I didn't say anything. I look back on it, and I'm always like, I wish I said something. And luckily, me and that person didn't work together. So I lucked out. And I will say, like, I, am a, I have a cautionary tale, like a PSA, that ends nicely. But not everyone has that luxury. And I also, as Dan and a few people have mentioned, I have a privilege of being a white man. right? So I, I could have fought that and yelled and screamed and, and done all that. So yes, it, it is something scary. But I don't think it's something you have to sit down and think, hmm. I'm ready to fight when I get like discriminated or harassed, but be prepared on how you process that. I think that's why you need support systems to, to process that with, to say, this just happened. What? 
I don't know how to feel about this. And based on how your mentor is reacting, they're like, what, what are you talking about? And they react and you're like, okay, I'm good to be mad. Or they say, oh yeah, this is, go to HR, go to the labor board, right? And have those people do it. So I don't know if that answered your question. If it didn't, I'm sorry. But I, I, I meant to answer it. It's funny because <laughs> all of these, many of these things, almost, almost all of these things apply also in race discrimination cases, in ethnic, ethnic uh, national origin and ethnic discrimination, like th those cases also. It's funny how they, the same problems recur and the solutions are the same. The mechanisms of safety, they seem to be similar. Very nice. Um, so yeah, I think that this is about, we are reaching the end of our time together. Um, so I think I want to give everyone the opportunity, we'll work our way down the line, and just give a few, we'll start the other way, sure, um, to uh, just give a few parting words, um, anything that you want to say, a final message. Um, do we want to start off with Dr. Ghosh? Sure. Uh, it's just, uh, we've been talking about this in one way or the other, but remember one thing, there's an LGBT mafia there just is, <laughs> and we're everywhere. You want to use that, because other people use their networks. We have to use that. It's an unjust world, okay? We take care of our own. We just do. That's what I have to say. I think of our, the one thing that I'm thinking about in our conversation about jobs and applying and kind of your decision on whether to out yourself, for lack of a better term, is also think about your social media presence and how that parallels what's on your resume. And I don't mean a cautionary tale, like someone's gonna look at your Facebook, but I can assure you that if I ask everybody on this panel to raise their hand if they sat on an interview and didn't Google the candidate first, almost every person would raise their hand because I Google them right away, right? And if you don't want your employer to know about your sexual identity or your sexual preference, whatever that might be, you have to think about if they Google you. Right, and think about it within the context of today, but always think about your social media presence um, and get a mentor. If I haven't made that clear enough, get a mentor. <laughs> so, mentor, you yes, mentor. No. Um, you know, I would say whether you're doing your research on a company or organization, or or when you get to the interview process, remember that you know, like, yes, you want a job and you want to pay your bills, but like, that's a two-way street, and so you're interviewing that company or that organization as much as they're interviewing you. So, if you're talking about the beforehand, like, do the research to the extent you can. Like, do your values match up with the values of the organization so far as you can tell? And then, you know, I would say, especially for LGBT people, when you're in the interview, like, don't be afraid if you're comfortable to ask those questions. Like, what are the support groups in places? Like, is there an ally group? Like, you know, do they have, like, something for women of color? Whatever it is, however it matches up with you, like, don't be afraid to ask those questions because as much as you need them, like, you are going to become a part of that organization, that structure, that family. So make sure that it fits your needs as well. You took the words, like, it, it, my point exactly, you are interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. Um, you are the person who has to show up every day and be there, so if that's not a place you want to spend 40 hours a week with these people, then you're not gonna be happy there regardless of what the work is. Um, and a little bit you're saying, ask about the groups for you, ask about the groups that are there for people who aren't you. So ask yeah. about, and it's specifically if you are a person who holds privilege, especially as white folks, like. What does the community say about people, about everyone and what exists? And so what does that mean about the workplace in its entirety? And what kind of culture do you want to be in? And what resources exist? And you're the person who's got to show up and who's got to be there. And so if you're not going to be physically happy there, like. I would echo um, Cyril's gay mafia, um, <laughs> right? Um, that like you want to find your, like your network of other queer people who are going to lift each other up. I would also um, say that like there is no perfect workplace, right? So we all have an ideal, and I we I like I want you to find your ideal thing, and that's but like it may take a little work, it may take a little bit of trial and error and that sort of thing. So it's it's not about finding the perfect work workplace. It's about finding the workplace that where the pros outweigh the cons, and that you can you can thrive in. Um, I would also say like I mean one. One, one thing I would add is that like, yes, we're all here of talking about being LGBTQ in the working world, right? Um, but we all go into such different, we all have diverse fields and interests, right? Um, so do what you, just do what you do well, do it in a way that makes you proud of yourself at the end of the day, right? 
Mine's kind of similar to that. I think that you all should make sure that you take pride in your body of work and the experience you have going into any interviewer resume. I notice a lot with my peers, people who are a year or so younger than me, they'll say things like, oh yeah, well I did this one internship, but like it didn't really matter that much. Don't do that. Everything that you have done matters because it has built up the body of work you have now. And even if it was like something you learned in class, just own it because it's still a skill and it'll still be useful somewhere. Do my best to keep it brief. Um, so the one thing that comes into my head is this concept of, you know, once you end up getting to this place where you have a full-time job and you're working 40 hours a week and you feel like you really don't have time for much else, you can make time for things when it comes to this kind of stuff. Don't feel like you can't. I mean, obviously you have to prioritize some things like sleep, eating, working, that kind of thing. But at the same time, like, do not ever let it make you feel like your journey has ever stopped. Because the thing is, like, nothing's ever really set. A job may start, a job may stop, and you have to find a new thing to do, but you don't stop. The world does not stop. Your journey does not stop. So don't think that just because you have this position and that you're in this particular stage in your life, that anything has to stop, that your exploration has to stop, that your questioning ever has to stop. It doesn't, and you shouldn't let it. Absolutely. Um, I want to have a big round of applause for our panelists. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to shift into the next part of our evening. Um, we're running just a little bit over time, um, but I would like to take the next half hour or so. Um, Elise and Costco have set up a wonderful um, dessert spread for us. Um, Costco is a queer haven, if you didn't know. <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. Um, but I would like to take this next half hour um, for all of our audience members to have an opportunity to get to mix um, with our panelists and get to speak with them. Um, and to kind of to share some information, knowledge, connections, and yeah, absolutely. So please enjoy yourself. There's coffee outside, and thank you all for joining us. So.